This is the You, Me, and BTC podcast. Cryptocurrency decrypted. Welcome to episode 68. This week is all about keeping secrets. First up, Tim and John will chat about the government and encryption. Some law enforcement officers have proposed that they should be given guaranteed access to encrypted data on smartphones. As you can probably guess, we think that's absurd. Tim and John will explain why they think a system like that would cause more problems than it would solve. Then later in the show, I'll be chatting with Steven Sprague, the CEO of Rivets. The tech startup is making it possible to securely store private keys on phones. Mr. Sprague will explain how this all works and why it should enable Bitcoin storage that is just as safe as a normal hardware wallet. Your hosts today are Tim Baker, John Stewart, and myself, Daniel Brown. Here we go. Hey everybody, this is just John and I this time, Daniel is not really sure what he's doing, but um, so John and I are doing this by ourselves today, how are you John? Uh, I'm doing pretty well, what about you? I'm pretty good, it's getting kind of late, like we're doing our normal thing at night, so I don't know why I felt the need to mention that, <laughs> <laughs> I sound like Daniel now, this is why he gets like that. Anyway, this week you should be getting one of Daniel's interviews with it, and then we're going to do the other half is going to be me and John with this. So we're going to be going through an article today that I got from the Washington Post. Its title is, As Encryption Spreads, U.S. Grapples with Clash Between Privacy and Security. And it's by, the article is by Ellen Nakishima and Barton Gelman. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. The whole point of the article, from what I can tell and from my understanding of it, is that with with all the new encryption stuff, with how Apple, especially Apple, I guess, recently, or not recently, but Apple's going to be coming out and encry- having more encryption for their uh, their phone, just their devices in general, where I, I don't know on which ones, probably they're going to start with their phones first, but, and the customer themselves would have the the key to to encrypt all the data and to uh to be able to read the data and this is kind of bothering some law enforcement especially uh a lot of people are bringing it up because of terrorism as we generally do with anything with communication that now even if you have something encrypted like this even apple can't the, if the government comes to Apple with a warrant, even Apple can't release the data to them. It's it's up to the it's up to the, whoever's holding the device. So people are making some noise in the in the law enforcement community, and some people are talking about trying to figure some way of setting up a way that they that the law enforcement could could decrypt all your data, but also have it be secure against other bad guys trying to get your data because obviously if you build like a back door in then it's it's an opening up for everybody so that's i think those are the two or i mean there's the, on the one side it's the government wanting it's the law enforcement the government wanting not necessarily what they're saying not they they don't want weaker encryption we just want an easier way to to catch criminals and stuff like that and stop terrorists from being able to talk uh, in private, and then the other side of that is most privacy, or in pretty any privacy advocates, and most, I don't know, in my in my opinion, most people in general, especially with the stuff that came out with Snowden, I don't see this happening, or this being like something where the government gets back doors to all our all your devices. I don't really see happening just because generally people, I think even in America, are pretty like why you don't need to like we're we're afraid of what's on our computers and phones and where that information goes with your like search history but we'll see what people do i guess what do you think john yeah yeah that there's a lot here to talk about 
I'll start, I guess, with Apple. I think that's pretty interesting that they decided to start doing that to where they they can't even get data off of their own customers' devices. I think that's pretty interesting. I don't really have anything to say about it besides it's interesting. Uh, just, just what you were saying, though, about how they, they're trying to figure out some way to be able to get access to this stuff, but not a backdoor. The, the way they describe it is... Um, well, somebody somebody said, I don't want a back door. I want a front door, and I want the front door to have multiple locks, big locks. This is uh, Michael S. Rogers, who's a director of uh, the nation's top electronic spy agency, who said that. Uh, so basically what it sounds like they're talking about is having a, a composite key or like an M of N key. This is something we've talked about before. It's kind of become a, a, a big deal in Bitcoin with having shared wallets with people and stuff. It basically seems like that's what they want, where the government will have a key and the the company, I guess, would have a key and then maybe the user would have a key and it'd be like, you need two out of three to unlock it. Something like that. Yeah, I think I mean, that's the only way I could think they could work that. Yeah, that that's what it sounds like. I mean, this article isn't... It's it's in the Washington post. It's not very technical and the people writing it probably don't have much of a technical background. So I can't be sure about all the details, but it it basically sounds like that's what they're talking about. Yeah. I mean, this sort of goes pretty good as far as like using the correct terms for stuff. And it's not too far into like, that's what I was saying about like, like any kind of tech person is normally pro privacy unless they're a tech person who's part of law enforcement um <laughs> so even this article even it, it even if it's even though it's the washington post it's still not like well we need to start like there's it's like it, it's pretty objective at least yeah for the most part there are a couple places where i have issues and we could probably just go through this like straight down the article and talk about things as they stand out if yeah unless you have any other beginning things not really, I mean... Well, this is uh, right below the picture, just so you can follow me. It says that um, some people... Like, it says this is making law enforcement officials kind of... It's kind of angering them a little bit, or worrying them, because they think it threatens what they describe as a centuries-old social compact in which, oh, yeah. the in which the government, with a warrant based on probable cause, may seize evidence relevant to criminal investigations. Now, I think people who think that there's some kind of social compact about this are insane. The fact that, like... Well, first of all, we can go all the way back, and, like, before there was any of this kind of digital communication or telecommunication... People just would have sent letters. If some guy is planning to murder somebody and he sends a letter to like a hitman or something, the hitman is probably going to burn that letter as soon as he reads it. This this isn't a centuries old social compact, and if it <laughs> and if it was, criminals are not going not, to. Yeah. They're not going to sign a compact or, or be part of a compact. Yeah, like I thought this. the whole thing about criminals was that they didn't. They weren't part of the social compact or social contract. Yeah, good citizens, and that's a huge issue with what they're talking about here. That I don't know. It seems like I, I don't think the article is presenting it this way. It's more the people that they're whose views they're talking about are thinking of it this way. That like that everybody has just agreed to the way that the government has been doing things. Yeah. When in re reality, I think people just haven't had a way to resist it or speak out against it until now. And now that they do, the fact that people, like a lot of people, like you were saying, I don't think there's probably many people who would be against encrypting stuff. And most people probably would feel a little weird about what they're proposing with this having yeah. government having yeah. keys. I think, like that just shows that there isn't a social compact. Like when people have an opportunity for privacy, I think they they want it. The the only reason people haven't been protesting before is because they've had nothing else. Like there's been, they haven't had a way to resist. Yeah. Well, I I think we've there there've been ways, but it's just 
either you don't understand or most people don't want to take the time, but once it starts getting built in, no one's going to be like, no, I don't want encryption. They'll be like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it's just people not wanting to deal with it because it's, it's kind of confusing, which, I mean, that makes sense. If you don't understand how something works, then you're not going to want to do it. You might mess it up. There's just a lot of reasons just not to do it, but if Apple's going to keep doing it, then I think a lot of people like that. Yeah, I mean, like if you don't, if you don't expect the government to be prying into your stuff, it's just easier to not worry about stuff like this. But whenever, I think, yeah, it's like whenever a company's going to offer to do it for you, most people are going to be like, yeah, sure. Do you, do you really, do you understand why they're they keep on bringing up the a warrant based on probable cause? Oh yeah, that's that's something I wanted to talk about. I had a couple thoughts about that maybe. Uh, real quick though, just on the same thing we were talking about, this is in the next paragraph, which is why I thought about it. And when I was reading the article, I, it was one of the things that jumped out at me. It said, they were talking about how they're worried about the risks. And uh, he says, what we're concerned about is the technology risks, bringing the country to a point where the smartphone owner alone, who may be a criminal or terrorist, has control of the data. And this goes back to the thing where where it's like they're expecting that criminals and terrorists are like have somehow agreed to this thing where they're just going to let people pry into their stuff and and it's like who may be a criminal or terrorist well the smartphone owner alone who may not be a criminal or terrorist yeah, like exactly it's it's like it's, why do they say that i think it's, it's at this point it's just it's assuming that people are it, it's it's exactly assuming that people are guilty until, until proven innocent. Like, we can't give you the power to be private about this stuff anymore because you might be... There's a possibility you might be talking about stuff we don't like, so nobody gets it. Yeah, exa yeah exactly. It's guilty until proven innocent. <laughs> like how you said, the nobody gets it. I was I was thinking, like, of an, an of an analogy earlier, and it's like... I don't, the, be the best thing I could come up with on the spot is that um like imagine a bunch of students taking a test and one person cheats so then the professor like takes 10 points off of everybody's test yeah or uh then doesn't let people use i yeah i don't know it just it doesn't make sense it and you can't make that argument because if you if you're working like especially off of the US justice system where you repeatedly say that people are innocent until proven guilty you cannot then pull this stuff and then try to display why you should be allowed to get involved in everybody's stuff because they might be guilty yeah i was going to bring that up too and i guess like with the the warrant what I don't understand with the warrant based on the probable cause thing involved with all this is that if you're getting the warrant because of something you find on this phone, is that still, con I'm just, do you have any idea of, is that still considered probable cause or I'd figured that'd be actual evidence? Well, see the way I thought of it was like the warrant was actually, the, what I think they were saying, I could be wrong, is that the warrant is to look at things on their phone or whatever, or like their computer oh. or their emails or whatever. So that's that's what confused me about the warrant because if they already have probable cause, there has to be some kind of evidence outside yeah, of the phone. Too. Yeah, like it's they had to have, it easier. They had to have already found something besides the phone. So why, if they already have probable cause, why do they need? To be able to access the phone there's surely got to be something else if somebody's actually doing this and that's an this is we maybe we'll get to this later on i guess i'll bring it up now because it relates to what i was talking about but one of the things one of the arguments they said and this is like ridiculously stupid is that there was a case where the <laughs> prosecution was stopped because they couldn't access somebody's data and i'm thinking if they couldn't prove the guy was guilty, then why are you saying that not being able to find his data stopped them from catching a guy? If like, like you just said that they don't, the reason he's not guilty is because they couldn't find stuff that was guilty, but he had to have been guilty. Yeah. Well, down at, like, and he yeah. didn't, he didn't let them find the evidence, but it was definitely there. <laughs> we know well, law enforcement are always right. It's just laws get in the way of them actually getting their man. 
the uh, one of the supervisors, which is even worse. He's not even just an agent. He's a supervisory special agent. Says, I just look at the number of cases I had where if the bad guy was using one of these locked devices, we never would have caught him. Said Timothy P. Ryan, former FBI supervisor, special agent, and I mean, it's kind. Of, I think it's just it just makes it easier. Like it just sounds lazy. Like, yeah. Well, we had this, but like if we had it, we can get a warrant, and then we'd have to go look at his house. But ugh. going back <sighs> to what I said earlier about like people burning letters or whatever, there's always been ways to hide evidence. Oh, it's yeah. not like this is a new thing, and and they're like, oh yeah, well if. If we have this, then it probably less criminals will get away. And they might be, that might be true. But you want to know how to get the least criminals, just like the second everyone's born, put them in prison. Like that way, <laughs> that way, no one will ever be a criminal. <laughs> it's just keep them locked up all the time. Yeah. It's like, you, yeah, there, there are ways that people who might genuinely have done bad things can hide. Like we were saying earlier, that's not a reason to punish every single other person because criminals are s still a minority and probably always will be a minority of people. I think criminals, like, wouldn't they have to be a minority just because if they're the majority, then they'd end up just taking everything over? I mean, I'm not, like, I'm seriously asking the question. I'm not trying to pick on the argument. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess you could argue that Maybe that's already happened. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I get. I yeah. Mean, a, okay. A lot of people say the government are just cr all criminals. I mean, I, they're probably. I don't know. I'm sure some of them are kind of unaware of what they're doing or some. Or I don't know. Like ignorant. Yeah, I don't know. I I wouldn't necessarily say that without knowing them more. Yeah. About, not, yeah. But um. Yeah, I mean, I I think criminals are. My, I think it's safe to say that criminals are a minority. And. So, um, I don't know, we kind of went off a little bit there, but the next thing that I saw that I had thought about talking about when I was reading it was, um, one guy, uh, Mark Zwillinger, an attorney working for tech companies on encryption related matters and a former justice department official. He says, um, he doesn't think that they should be able to access everything. He's basically on our side. And, and then he goes on to say, I don't think our founding fathers would think so either. The fact that the Constitution offers a process for obtaining a search warrant where there is a probable cause is not support for the notion that it should be illegal to make an unbreakable law. <laughs> I think that's like, that goes back to what we were saying about how it's just a way to make it easier. Just because it makes your job a little easier doesn't mean you're entitled to to that. And like like he's saying, it's it shouldn't... Making it harder to get caught is not the illegal part of a crime. Like, it's it seems like they're making it a crime to hide the fact oh, that you're a criminal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and it's like, that's just the most stupid law. <laughs> or that's, that's the stupidest thing to try to stop people from doing because yeah. they're criminals. They already don't care. Well, yeah, and there's no... any Anyone who's... If you're going to use this, like, say they get everything, they, they have a backdoor to every single thing in your data, then any kind of legitimate criminal that's actually going to be giving you any kind of a problem is going to be giving you a problem because he's encrypting his data some way else. You're only going to get these guys who are, like, who, who, who are stupid enough to not use an encrypted... I mean, you have those now. There's encrypted. Daniel and I use an encrypted text, text app, and I think it's end-to-end... -end. And, I mean, it's like our whole phones aren't encrypted, but, like, just the text messaging, that's already encrypted. We could yeah. already be terrorists. Who knows? I mean, all of us could be. They're, just, they're among us. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. I, I don't know why we didn't talk about this yet, but, like, the other major flaw with this is that it's unenforceable. Like, okay, if, if they make this law, I'm sure companies like Apple and stuff are going to comply and... That makes it bad for the people we were talking about earlier who they're not really going to bother too much with trying to keep this stuff private. Like they'll take it if they can they'll take it if they can get it easily, but they're not going to go out of their way to get stuff encrypted. But then the people who are criminals or the people who are willing to go out of their way or who are maybe more tech savvy, they're going to find other ways. 
And and this was mentioned in the article that a lot of people are saying that this is pretty much impossible to enforce. And I guess theoretically there are probably infinite ways to encrypt things. Like there are, there's a lot of ways to encrypt things and different algorithms and things like that. If there wasn't, we wouldn't be having this argument anyways. If there's only one way to encrypt things, they would already know how to do it. So there's nothing stopping from people just encrypting things in a different way, creating new algorithms and stuff. And it, it can just keep advancing. And honestly, if they're trying to crack down on this, all it's going to do is make people come up with better and better ways of encrypting things to the point where it's going to be like, it's just going to be ridiculously secure. Yeah. And, and the people who are criminals are obviously not going to say comply with, the fact that, oh, you're supposed to let us have a key. They're not going to be like, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I forgot about that. Well, there's even, there's so much, now there's so much stuff that's developed that's not even in the U.S. that the U.S. can't really get at that. I mean, they could kind of put some pressure on other nations, but they can't directly grab that and say that, like, any company can't. Or that any that every company has to install one of those back doors on their uh, systems. Yeah, and uh, another thing that they bring up a lot is how it'd be really hard to have something like this where giving the government access to this wouldn't make it easier for other people to break into your stuff. And that that's another major issue. And yeah, I don't I don't know if there's anything more to say about that. I mean, that the split key thing is something that they think might be able to fix that situation, but you mean the split key as far as using that at, to uh yeah, the the I think that's one of the things that they're trying to argue for throughout the the people that they're showing in this article are trying to argue is that we've been trying to come up with a way to do this without making it less secure yeah. like without making it easier for other people to break into your stuff and they're saying that having a split key might be the answer to that and that might be right and honestly i really think that they probably they're probably they probably actually do care about that i don't i think they're they probably care about not letting just anybody be able to break in any yeah. kind of yeah. like hacker on the street being able to break into your stuff the thing is that i think we've seen enough times where when you have an organization that's as big and inefficient as the u.s government is they make mistakes they and they might lose things yeah or they might think that something's secure and there's a flaw in it that they didn't they didn't plan for or they didn't know was there i don't think they they would intentionally make something where it's just everything is really easy for people to hack into, but I wouldn't trust them to come up with something completely secure either. <laughs> no, yeah, and yeah, I mean, even if it is, I just don't, obviously, I don't like the idea, just in general, of them having that. I mean, that pretty much goes without saying, but... Yeah. Because that's, maybe it's just me, I mean, I think a lot of, again, a lot of people like that, but I just like being like belli not belligerent about it, but it, it could be the easiest thing. It couldn't be invasive at all. It could be fine. It could be just as secure. It could be just as everything. It could be the... I still wouldn't like someone else having that. I still... It's like, it's mine. Why do you... It. I was thinking a little bit earlier on. I'm not sure how great the metaphor is, but you take the, the idea, but then if you're giving the government a backdoor to this lock, then why not... With that argument, why aren't we... Why don't you give them a a, a backdoor to anything, everything else? You give them keys to your house. I mean, they can break into your house, I guess, but um, yeah. give them the ability to start your car, to turn your car off, to stuff like that. And they, I, I'm not like people would run and people would say it's like, well, this is like Big Brother. I don't like. I do. I think I agree with you, John. That I do think it's mostly just because they're like, well, we just need to catch people it's not like this oh we just need to get people used to this like first we'll go into their phones then we'll go to their houses i don't think it's like i don't think it's anything like that but it's just a weird it, the 
the argument doesn't make sense for me, and I just don't really like how it sounds. Yeah, it's kind of a conspiracy thing. I think most things with government, it's kind of just like people in power do these kinds of things because they have power and they can get away with it. I don't think it's like this gen this grand scheme. But <laughs> to, to take but, over the world. But another thing, like you were saying, why don't they just give keys to anything? And I think this was something that was mentioned in this article. Why should protecting your emails or data on your smartphone be any different from exercising a Fifth Amendment right? I mean, you you not you don't have to incriminate yourself if you're allowing the government into all your stuff. Doesn't that fall under incriminating yourself? Yeah, if if they can somehow compel you, like if they're gonna say they. I think they brought it up in the article about how police would ask, like, asking them to unlock their phones, uh, just with, like, a, the touch screen or the, the pin code you put in. But it would also be interesting if they did divvy it up and have a mult three, a three way multi sig or just split the key up three ways if they'd be able to force people. I mean, I guess they wouldn't really need the people because they could just use their key and then the manufacturer's key, but... Yeah, and the manufacturers would have to be compliant in the first place to implement this. Yeah, but it's like the police, they can lie to you legally about, like, they could tell you that you have to open up your phone, and I don't I don't know if you do or not legally. If you have to, and it probably differs by state, but if you have to open your phone for them or not, so that's... I don't think you do. Yeah, I I would guess that you don't. I I like I said I don't see how that should be any different than verbally incriminating yourself. And um the article also says uh that they think the odds of passing this law appear pretty slim given a divided congress and increased attention to privacy in the aftermath of leaks by former NSA contractor Ed Snowden. So yeah, even even this article seems to pick up on the fact that people are a little bit more aware of this kind of stuff now and they care about privacy more than they have in the past because you know, they've seen how things have been taken advantage of. Okay, yeah. It's looking just as an aside, it's looking like uh you don't have to put up your your phone at least in Pennsylvania. Okay. Yeah, I didn't really get this, just the one, or I mean, I got it, but their one example of, like, how or why this is good is just some trucker raping a girl. I was yeah, like, yeah, I wanted to talk about that, too, because the story that I mentioned earlier where they're like, well, we almost caught this guy, but we couldn't prove he was guilty, even though we knew he was. They They give these two stories right after each other. It's like, first, they throw you the story about how... Not being able to access somebody's data prevented them from catching a guy. And then they give a story of how accessing somebody's data enabled them to catch a guy that was, like, a criminal. Right after each other. And it, it's like, uh, it's such a sneaky argument. <laughs> because, first of all, there was a thing that uh, that I said earlier that if they couldn't prove this guy was guilty, maybe he actually wasn't. That's a huge hole in that that half of the argument and then the second half is that they were only able to catch that other guy because they could get into his data like those are the assumptions that are made by making that argument it's when you read it it seems kind of convincing but if you i don't know if you give any thought to it at all they they force you to make those assumptions that the guy who wasn't caught was actually guilty and that the only way they were able to catch the guilty guy was by being able to look into his stuff. And neither of those things are really provable. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'd imagine they wouldn't have had that much trouble getting that guy, getting a trucker on sexual assault. I feel like that's going to sell itself in the courtroom. And even if he didn't, I mean, even if they didn't, like, she probably could have filed for a restraining order or something. I don't know how this worked, but I'm sure that even if he wasn't exactly convicted for the crime that she said he was, uh, I guess, I don't know if we said it, but it was a guy who sexually assaulted his girlfriend and 
when he or when she came back and tried to press charges, he said that it was consensual, and they they caught him because there was video, and because and they were able to break into his phone where the video was. I don't know exactly how this works, but I'm sure. I don't know. I she probably could have gotten something even if they hadn't been able to convict him on exactly what she was accusing him of. You mean as far as her being removed from the threat? Yeah. Well, that's not the goal. The goal is to... You must punish people, John. That's always the <laughs> yeah. most important, is someone has to be punished. Yeah, and I, I think these kind that's of things... That's I'm, they... I'm not trying to defend the guy. It's just like... Yeah. You know, people are like, oh my goodness, he, like, he and could it, have been free and... like. In he, these kinds of situations, they generally tend to favor the like the person who's claiming to have been assaulted yeah yeah especially if it's a a male on female thing yeah yeah <laughs> yeah no i wasn't gonna be... i wasn't gonna say that but i was thinking it i probably should have said it i mean there's well, no I, reason not to well that's kind of what i meant with the trucker thing too it's like you go in like a, a jury with a trucker is sexually assaulting his girlfriend and the girlfriend said it, it, it's the guy's word against hers. I really don't think the jury's going to listen to the guy in that yeah. situation. Just in general, that doesn't seem how those things go. Yeah. We could go off on that. Yeah, but I think we already did. But yeah, and then, and then just continuing on with that, that kind of fallacious argument in the next paragraph, somebody says... I just look at the number of cases I had where if the bad guy was using one of these devices, we never would have caught him. You mentioned that earlier. Yeah. But it's like, how can you know that, first <laughs> of all? Second of all, how many people... It's not like you catch every single criminal. How many people are getting away even though they don't have these devices? And third, if it's not this, it's just some some other way of hiding. It always has been in the past, and if they get this, they're just going to find another way to hide. Like I said, there's other ways to encrypt things, and even if we're not talking about encryptions, I'm sure people could go back to doing crimes without using their phones. Yeah, if you take it away from them, we'll figure out something else. Yeah, it's just, uh, I don't really see... Well, like, like the article said, the chances of it passing are probably not very high, first of all, or them being able to to do something like this are not very high and if if they are able to do something about this i doubt it will be that effective and all it's really going to do is just make things more difficult for tech companies who are going to have to start complying with it and for people who are going to have to deal with it Hey guys, I want to tell you about Wall of Coins, a brand new and very handy service for trading Bitcoin. The platform is designed to enable anyone to get their hands on some Bitcoin. Buyers are quickly connected to an authorized, trusted seller within the Wall of Coins network. Just set a dollar amount for your order, safely pay at a bank near you, and you instantly own more Bitcoin. Buyers don't even have to create an account, so anyone can have access to Bitcoin. Got some extra coin lying around? With Wall of Coins, you can sell it for cash, available immediately in your bank account. Visit wallofcoins.com right now to see just how easy it is. everybody thanks for joining us today I am Daniel Brown and right now I am sitting down with mr. Steven Sprague he is the CEO of rivets r-i-v-e-t-z and first of all Steven thanks a lot for joining us today uh, thanks for having me so I, I just I guess I'll just let you uh, get started and take it away can you tell us what rivets is what do you do what is your goal tell us all about it Sure. Rivets is a company that is focused on um, exposing the built-in hardware security capabilities that are in existing um, ARM-powered phones. So um, primarily on the Android platform today, 
And uh, inside the ARM chipset, there is actually a hardware security capability that's been there for a number of years and has recently been exposed through a series of capabilities with a company called Trustonic. And uh, we're leveraging those capabilities to both hide and protect secrets uh, within the trusted execution environment that's in that chip. Okay, sweet. So uh, can you tell us a little bit more about what would have been wrong with, with Android and what you're doing to, to fix it and make things yeah. better? Sure. So, so the real challenge that we have in any smartphone today is that you can't hide a secret in the operating system. And we've seen this, you know, through a r range of different companies that have had hacks, everybody from Snapchat to, uh, to even aspects of Bitcoin wallets, where it's relatively simple to steal the private key okay. that's protected by the operating system. And so what we're doing is now taking that private key and the processing of the data by that private key and running it in an isolated operating system in the hardware of the chip. And so what happens inside the actual chip is the processor interrupts the primary operating system and then performs whatever manipulations um, are necessary of a private key to form a transaction. And there's a second capability that we expose called trusted user interface. And trusted user interface allows us to draw on the screen a message. In this case, for example, the amount, the account that you're going to send the amount from, any service fees, um, and to who the payment is going, and have that confirmation of transaction done through a secure pin pad. And so you have the ability to collect a pin number in a manner that it cannot be stolen by malware running on the operating system. So finally, you have all the parts you need for a really high quality instruction to the Bitcoin network, which is a properly signed um, transaction where the user consent has been properly collected through secure pin entry and using state-of-the-art security within the Android phone you already have. Okay, now this is, this is really fascinating to me, something I would love to learn more about. So I, I have several questions, and I'll try and keep them all straight. But first, I want to ask, is this a feature that you are adding to the software to make it work this way? Or are you adding hardware to phones that can do this? So the, the manufacturers have added the feature to the hardware okay. over the course of the last couple of years. So there are already about 400 million phones that have this capability. And the trusted user interface capability is new, and that's just started shipping. And, and the first mainstream line to have it across the board is the Galaxy S6 phone. So okay. if you're going to do Bitcoin, buying an S6 Galaxy phone will be the most secure Bitcoin wallet over the course of the next six months. Okay, that, that is awesome. I have a Galaxy on me now. I love the Galaxy. Not an S6, but I probably will eventually. So I'm not an expert here, so... This is great. I think a great opportunity for for me to kind of learn some more about this because we were we did an episode, I don't know, probably two or three episodes ago and we started mentioning hardware wallets and stuff and well, there were just some things that we weren't too sure about about uh having a a hardware wallet on a phone or something like that. So it seems kind of like that's what you're doing here is where you can store information on the phone kind of like a hardware wallet does where it's inaccessible except by that chip itself right it's basically a hardware wallet that you can keep on your phone that's correct and and in many cases because it's fully integrated in a high function device there are lots of pieces that are possible around the integrity of that secure container and the measurement of it and the supply chain of how that gets created that will ultimately result in it probably being one of the most secure um, mechanisms to have uh, available to you. Um, so there are trade-offs always in hardware or in any security model, but having something that you have on itself that you continuously monitor, you'll, you, you tend not to lose your phone. Yeah, or when yeah. you lose it, you know you lost it, right? You don't accidentally <laughs> lose your phone, right? And not know about it for a month, where you might accidentally lose a USB token that you have money on or you know there, there are lots of other ways that devices can go missing and you're not aware but your phone you're persistently aware of right yeah I, I definitely agree i think that's a great way to do things i mean as always i mean keep things diversified but that would definitely be a great way to 
to keep, you know, part of your funds. I'm I'm not sure if this is too technical or anything, so feel free to to go as in depth or as broad as you can. But one thing that just fascinates me in general is is the fact that you can have, uh, you know, whether it's on your phone or even on a hardware wallet that you keep in a safe. It, it fascinates me that there can be data, like a private key that you can you can sort of use it, but you can't really read it. You you know you you can have it sign messages, but you can never actually get the private key from it. Is there any any guidelines or, or anything you could tell me about how that works, you know, from a hardware or a software standpoint? Just what makes that possible for you to be able to use data without necessarily being able to read the exact data? So this comes to the core reason of why you need hardware. The beauty of hardware is that it can be designed to have specific functions that only work in a certain way and it's not possible for malware to change the copper wires it you know the 0 0.1 0.09 micron level <laughs> in a chip because a software hack won't work on a hardware chip if it has functions that are designed to only work one way and so you can build a very high assurance tested function like store a key where that private key can be stored, but it can never be copied. Right. And so, so for example, it's created inside a portion of memory that the processor can utilize that data for manipulation, but there's no actual set of wires or instructions that allows that chip to export the key. And so the only way to export the key is to take the top off the chip, put probes down <laughs> into the bus, and read the memory locations. And so what the chip manufacturers do is a variety of different techniques to hide and protect the keys within those memory locations. And, and so that's a very well understood science because they've been making smart card chips and SIM modules and set-top box chips for many, many years. And, and it's been a cat and mouse game of, hiding secrets, breaking chips, hiding secrets, breaking chips. <laughs> and, and so today, you could argue that these devices are probably good for a million dollars or more in value because it probably costs more than that nice. to take one key out of one device. That is, that is really cool. I mean, it's absolutely fascinating that, that that's possible. I hope someday I can understand that a lot more and... and but that's that's you know the cool thing about any technology is you don't necessarily have to know exactly how it works it's it can all be abstract and stuff so that's really cool and i'm i'm glad you guys are making that happen especially on phones can you tell me about the the risks and the drawbacks that you mentioned just even though this is you know it could easily be one of the most secure ways to to store coins and stuff what are there any avenues that that could be used aside from from you know looking straight at the hardware i don't know maybe is it possible for them to send messages and get messages signed without reading the key just i don't know any risks or drawbacks that you see so so with any solution um security is a process it's not there's no silver bullet and and i think that's one of the reasons why it's very valuable for a company like rivets to implement this what we're trying to do is provide a set of tools and capabilities for any wallet provider to incorporate uh, so that we can help address some of the cybersecurity expertise that we bring to the puzzle without every wallet provider having to learn all the things that, that have taken us decades to understand. And so let me give an example. One of the key tests in hardware is, is the hardware performing um, properly or has something changed? And so there's a whole process of attestation or testing that the, your device is in a known healthy state. And you really want to run that test all the way from the birth of the device at its manufacturing all the way up through today's use. And, and there are a set of technologies that come out of the Trusted Computing Group that define how to do that process. And there are actually some good international and even governmental standards on how to do those cybersecurity controls. And so we see a tremendous opportunity in, in the Bitcoin and blockchain ecosystem to incorporate that testing 
as part of a multi-sig transaction when you spend your money. So that every time you do a transaction, whether you're buying a coffee or a car, you're testing that the device is in a known good state okay. um, and incorporating that in the transaction. And one of the byproducts of that is you'll be able to look at the blockchain, know that one of those attestation multi-sig transactions was done, and therefore have some cybersecurity controls that tell you more about that transaction than you would have otherwise known before, like that it was a known device at a known time in a known condition that performed that transaction. So you, you can then go ask questions if anybody ever disputes that the transaction was intended or not. I think the other piece that's really interesting in this space is we're very focused on helping to connect your collection of devices together. So your phone, your tablet, your PC, so that you don't have just a single device where you're um, keeping your funds, that you really have the opportunity to have your collection of devices be your identity and not just your one thing. And, and that provides redundancy. It helps you in the case you lost a phone. If you add a new device, you can instantly add it to your collection, et cetera. That, that's, again, absolutely fascinating. I, I can't wait to start using this kind of stuff. I mean, since, since it was created, one of, the most important thing, one of the most important things about Bitcoin is just keeping it secure. And that's something that, you know, there's been innovations, there's been good ideas and good projects and stuff that have come about, but it can always get better. And this sounds like one of the best ways to do it is to have a hardware wallet with you all the time. And I, I love the idea of syncing it too. I, I'm, I'm always, always, always looking for ways to, to synchronize my devices and transfer things between them. And it sounds perfect. So I really can't wait to, to see some of this come about. So, yeah. So, so we're, we're excited about actually getting it, you know, to market. We're just finishing the production state of the tools as we speak. And so we would expect that there'll be first third party applications using the Rivet security tools um, in, in this quarter. So before June 30th. Oh, market. nice. And, uh, and something that, you know, you should be able to go and, and download into a, um, a current generation phone um, quite easily in, in, in Q3 at scale, you know, so. We're, we're, we're getting very close to that point. We have a number of great partners. We're, we're just in the process of onboarding um, all of the Omni protocol. We just added multi-sig capabilities. Um, HD is coming, you know, HD wallet capabilities are coming next. And uh, actually we're having a good time with uh, one of the uh, partners, uh, a company called Infinity Algorithms, who's been building for the, the MadeSafe network as well. So we're also very excited about that. That that's great. And just to clarify, you're building like the you're you know, Rivets is not like an app or anything. You're building tools for other apps to use on phones and stuff, right? That's correct. When you install it, you will see a Rivets app and it basically is a background app in your phone. Um and it's there to um help you to to manage the different services that use it, um, and also to help you manage this connection between more than one device. And so we'll have a small presence, um, okay. but ultimately the keys that are created are owned by the app vendor who creates them. Um, it's their identity. They choose how they want to use them, how long they last, when they delete them. And we really see a range of applications beyond um, just Bitcoin and blockchain applications as well. Um, we're very excited. We have a partner that's doing work in the chat um, area, a company called Chatter. Oh, that's um, awesome. And they are um, implementing support rivets in chat so that your chat messages are properly protected, you know, stuff in the storage space. Um, uh, we look forward to working with Factum, we've announced with recently. And, and, and so there are many uses of this sort of basic model of protect keys, do a little encryption, some secure user interface. Those components put together, we think, add value, uh, you know, whether you're trying to order an Uber or you want to do a Bitcoin <laughs> transaction. Everybody has the same problems. Yeah. Oh, I love I love the idea of messaging too. I I encrypt my messages now with some people, but that's always something that can be improved and just an easier interface, more secure, and everything. So that's the same problem that Bitcoin has. Right. I can steal your keys today, and if I steal your keys, I can impersonate you, or I can read any message that are sent to you. And 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 the problem is you don't know when I've cloned your keys. Oh, yeah. The yeah. beauty of rivets is that I can create a, a 
unique key that there is exactly one instance of, and um, your phone becomes the key. And whether it's your phone or your tablet or your PC is is somewhat irrelevant. This capability is across those platforms. The you know when you lose something because you have to physically lose your device. And and I think that's the real difference here is that today you can lose a username and password or you can lose a key to a piece of malware and you have no 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 knowledge that it happened until damage right. happens. If you lose your phone, you, you, yeah, it only takes a few minutes before you know. It depends on how old you are, right? If you're like <laughs> 17, it takes like what, five minutes before you're like, ah! <laughs> complete end. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's that's great. I have one kind of a different kind of question that we like to do with uh, as many as our guests as we remember to. Do you have any more personal stories that you could share about your time in the Bitcoin space or or just in your in your development, you know, rivets area? Just something, you know, if you saw some amazing innovation, if you met some awesome people, if you saw things that could change the world, just about anything goes here. But just for fun, we like to ask people. Sure about some some fun personal story in in your space so i got introduced to bitcoin when and somebody called me up and said you need to go to the miami bitcoin conference a year <laughs> ago and it was a thursday night and and it was in the middle of the winter time it was five degrees outside i live in western massachusetts and i had to be in baltimore on that monday morning and uh and so i'm like okay let's see i could go to miami for the weekend <laughs> And uh, booked a flight, went and went to Miami, read the Satoshi white paper on the airplane going down there. Oh, man. Got off the airplane, got to the party, went up in the elevator and was introduced immediately to the um, gold girls at the or first or the, I guess, second Miami Bitcoin conference. <laughs> who were handing us drinks when we got off there, which was quite, quite impressive. That was the sort of first sign that I knew I wasn't at a normal cryptography conference. I've been working in trusted computing at that point for over a decade and a half. And so I've been up to a lot of conferences with people talking about crypto. <laughs> and it was very clear to me that in, in really the first hour of hanging out at the cocktail party at the Miami Bitcoin conference, that this mixing of the trusted computing space to protect the client or the peer device in a peer-to-peer -peer banking model was a missing piece to the whole Bitcoin architecture, which is everybody's focused entirely on the back office side. And so I walked away from Miami with two observations, one which was my first blog post, which if you go to Rivets and read our blog, it's the first blog post that we have up, which is that blockchain is a new capability on the Internet. And it's the ability for the Internet to store a fact. And I thought it was just sort of a great way to think about a simple model of what it is. Yeah. And the Internet's always been able to store information, but that information is always possible to change by someone who's in charge. The beauty of the blockchain is we can now store information that we can prove hasn't been changed. And, and so that was an interesting observation. And, you know, I think the, the second one is that a critical piece of infrastructure for Bitcoin is that we have to have high quality instructions that are sent to the blockchain. And so when you think about it, the blockchain will digest a bad instruction. If I steal your keys and move all your money somewhere else, the blockchain doesn't care. Right. And so what this is all about is improving the quality of the instructions okay. that are sent to the blockchain. And so those were the two, you know, pictures that kind of were um, left, you know, w when I left Miami and, and just for fun, because I used to play in very broad aspects of enterprise and government security. I did go directly from the Miami Bitcoin conference to the NIST NSA cybersecurity conference in Baltimore. <laughs> and that was a delightful hatch. I, I just can't tell you how much fun that was. <laughs> of course, everybody in Baltimore wanted to know what happened at the Bitcoin conference. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that sounds like a lot of fun. I'm glad you got invited. I'm glad you started to figure all that stuff out. And I hope it uh, goes somewhere amazing. Before we wrap up, I guess if you could just remind people how they can get in touch, how they can keep track, I don't know, website, Twitter handle, whatever you like to share, where should people be sure. looking for you? Yeah, best way to learn information about Rivets is um, go to our webpage. All our developer tools are there. There's a whole bunch of open source examples that are there. And uh, you can sign up to join our developer program and we can provide you with more infrastructure. And that's www dot rivets.com rivets is spelled r-i-v-e-t-z.com 
Uh, and anybody who wants to send me email can reach me, um, Stephen, spelled with a V, at rivets.com. And uh, we're really excited to be bringing, you know, really true state-of-the-art e-commerce uh, security to the Bitcoin space, leveraging the state-of-the-art hardware tools that are there. Uh, and this is how we'll go get a few hundred million hardware wallets in everybody's hands. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We hope so. Well, yeah, this was awesome. Thanks a lot for joining us. This was Stephen Sprague from Rivets. Thanks again. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks for listening to episode 68. All of the music in today's show was from John Stewart. Remember to check out this week's show notes at you, me, and btc.com and leave us a comment. We'll see you next Thursday.